Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders. Welcome back to another episode of the Intermediate Series and today we are looking at this absolutely gorgeous snake, the Baron's Racer, Philodryas baroni. This semi-arboreal snake is much coveted in the hobby and it's a hardy species from an interesting region uh, and this species hails from uh, the Chaco regions of uh, Bolivia, Paraguay and Argentina. The Chaco Boreal to the north, the Grand Chaco in the centre and the Austral Chaco to the south are an example of an alluvial plain. This is where montane river networks will drop their sediment loads that they're carrying that builds up soil deposits. These soils build up over time and create fertile land for grasses and moist forest for at least part of the year and savanna woodlands. Across the range of this species, the climate is hugely changeable. Hi. You are amazing, aren't you? Yeah, we're friends. Are hugely changeable. And as our climate data shows, which we'll go through later, um, liable to massive fluctuations. And this huge variability and unreliability of the weather has made the Barons Racer incredibly adaptable. This adaptability translates to hardiness in captivity. Hardiness is one of the key things that we want from our snakes when we keep them. We want them to be sturdy, we want them to be robust, and moreover, the hardiness is um, a, the ability to maybe take uh, environments that aren't ideal and the ability to be able to change with the environments and survive and do okay is a keystone of hardiness. This guy's got it in abundance. Well, this girl, sorry, you're a beautiful lady, aren't you? Many insist on keeping this species in a tropical manner, but the data does not support this, with a large period of the year being near drought conditions. Plus, if we keep them too wet, fungal and skin conditions can occur if kept persistently too moist. Provision of a damp hide is recommended, but for the most part the vivarium can be kept relatively dry. Occasional spraying at most is all that's necessary with a slight increase in regularity of those sprays during the shedding cycle. Quoted on certain sites as being an exclusively arboreal species, this is just simply not true. Semi-arboreal is more the mark, and they'll partake in climbing and draping in a loose and relaxed manner, but equally at home underneath caves and logs within the vivarium as well. An adult snake is bigger than people would think, with older mature females capable of topping out at six feet or more in length, which is incredible considering how beautiful you are i'd love to see a six foot version of that what a cracker you know um most animals tend to be more than four and a half to five and a half feet length mark uh, and care must be taken not to create obese animals in the quest to produce a six foot baroni um diet is unproblematic they are ready feeders and they will take lizards and birds and mammals in the wild and obviously the birds and mammals they will continue to take in captivity quite readily and we have a ready supply of lab rodents so that just works out great um, they uh, are capable of taking very good sized meals they have very very wide gape and they these this benefits us with adult animals even being quoted as taking up to medium rats which is impressive i mean i won't feed you much more than a wiener but you know according to what i've read it probably quite easily take a a large wiener or possibly even a small rat this one's probably a, just short of 48 inches long um they're across the board pretty much ready feeders their reputation is that of reliability when it comes to food uh i sought some advice from francis kaskiri today who uh, is probably responsible for the majority of the UK origin animals. He bred them repeatedly for many years. And he noted that even the hatchlings could tackle pinkies despite their diminutive size and will quickly progress onto fuzzy mice and grow at a rate of knots. 
So, with them being a larger animal than maybe we first anticipated, adult vivarium should be spacious in this regard. Uh, and the minimum sort of adult size vivarium would be a 60 by 24 by 24 inch vivarium, so a 5 by 2 by 2, with a view to being even larger if possible. Heat in an environment of this size would be best accomplished by a ceramic heat emitter, although you could also use spot bulbs or deep heat projectors or a combination of the above, as long as you have control with a reliable thermostat system so that we can uh, mimic the day-night cycle and the uh, circadian rhythms of the snake. Um, the, the, the basking area is uh, can be set... So I've stalled out. What have I done? Made me forget where I was. Start again. Put my teeth in. Basking area can be around 30 degrees, and if it's localised to a small area, it can be even warmer than this. But it's imperative that the animal must be able to escape from that temperature to cool down. And uh, the, the possibility to retreat is a prerequisite. Nighttime drops are significant, and therefore that's why we would need the day-night unit. And it could drop to between 20 and 24 degrees Celsius with no problem. Substrate for the vivarium would be a mix of orchid bark, core, soil and dry moss mixes. And this is to create a savanna grassland type substrate that won't rot when it comes time to shed the skin. Plus the animals will also hide in it and they'll bury down in it as well, given the opportunity. Uh, this species uh, would be forced into a brumation by the climate where they're from. And a less extreme version of this should be recreated in captivity to ensure good sperm count in the males and good fertility in females. The clutch size post brumation once the animals breed depends on the female but it could be anything from 12 to 25 eggs and the largest of females may even exceed this. Incubation can be undertaken at between 28, 26 and 28 degrees Celsius, so cooler than some of the species we discussed previously. And this is probably down to the montane aspect of the Chaco, which is around a thousand feet above sea level. And a relatively dry mix with it being predominantly dry savanna uh, woodland that the animals are from, the four to one, so four parts vermiculite to one part water. Coloration is variable, anything from green, such as this beautiful animal, to olive, and then also through to brown and blue. Uh, the most common being the green and olive animals, such as this, and particular interest exists in good examples of the brown and blue variants. This is a rear fanged species, or an epistoglyph, and this means that it has a rudimentary venom system where it can run down groove teeth at the back of the mouth, um, but this animal also will constrict its prey as well. So it's like a double hit of techniques. Um, and I can feel a really good grip holding onto my hand. I'm really impressed with how she's supporting herself. And, you know, it just, just a phenomenal animal. The nasal appendage is different according to the sex size as well. And the female has got a smaller appendage. The boys is longer. And tail shape may not be an accurate indicator as we've now probed this one three times because its tail th is throwing us off that much. It's still thick post vent though it doesn't sort of taper off the way that most females do. So, you know, traditional colubrid tail shapes would be suggested that it was a boy, but it's just simply going nowhere. One and a half scales deep if that. And a male I'd expect to probe best part of a seven or eight scales if not more. So, um... Where was I? Yeah, yeah, rear fang species, um, and they also constrict people differ in sensitivity to the bites, and some people do report a burning sensation upon being bitten, and reports of edema, which is uh, water retention or fluid retention around the bite and swelling, and maybe some stiffness in the joints uh, localized to where the bite was. This forces the snake into the intermediate series, and whilst the majority of the husbandry would see them comfortably sit in the introducing series. In an ideal world, had they the, the, the shit not been bred out of them, Western hognoses would have the same uh, rule set applied to them. Uh, but because they are so commonplace, I had no choice but to put them into the introducing series. And um, because I would just be answering endless nightmare smart ass questions about why they were uh, in the intermediate series. But by rights, the reaction is as strong or stronger as a Western hognose and therefore we should give them a little bit of respect and we certainly wouldn't want to wind them up and get them to the point where they're um, 
they're biting us so realistically the only responsible place to put this is in the intermediate series where we would recommend you had a bit more in the way of experience and therefore you'd be more comfortable with an animal that potentially could envenomate you if you weren't careful so distribution as we can see is this orange section here with the southeastern element of uh, Bolivia the northwestern element of Paraguay and the northern section of Argentina so this is your three different Chacos uh, with the Grand Chaco in the center, which is where we based most of it. Um, so we've taken five different localities uh, within their natural range. These are Catamarca, Salta, Cordoba, Santiago del Estero and Chaco itself. And what we've then done is plot out our daytime highs, nighttime lows, compared the two, and looked at rainfall. So as we can see, there is a fair amount of variation in the daytime highs. We've, we've basically scattered and dotted where the localities are and put a thick red bar for the average. So there is some real variation there with like the hottest months approach 36 degrees Celsius is the hottest. 36, pretty warm, considering where we are, Argentina. And it seems that across the range, that peak even like in another region may only hit sort of 27. So the, this is where the variability and that hardiness comes from. 36 to 27, I mean, that's, the, you know, the, 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 there's nine degrees there difference um, in daytime high in the hottest month. And the coolest month, we're dropping down to 18s during the day. Whereas other elements, their coolest, coolest uh, time of year is probably 22, 23. Where the biggest drops occur and the biggest dip occurs is at night and this is obviously from exposure from being so far up a thousand feet up in the mountain range in that plateau where the grasslands have formed some variation exists again but we are getting down to single figures with the smallest being three four and five degrees celsius in the coolest months so this would force the animals into brumation they can't remain active at those temperatures so here we have set out daytime high versus nighttime low and the data spread does increase in winter so daytime high stays more buoyant the nighttime just plummets drops off we've got probably a 10 degree line here which is going to show us where activity had pretty much stopped and that is for four months of the year from mid-may to mid-september with nighttime low averages of uh, 9.6 to reduce into 6.8 redu uh, reducing to 5 increasing to 7.2 and then back to 10 um, and yeah so th th they ain't going to be doing much during this period what's also interesting because this is southern hemisphere so our uh, our summer months are January and December, our winter months are June and July, and the rainfall all but stops in winter. So from May through to August, which is their winter period, pretty much bone dry. Single digits for, for everybody. The only one that books the trend is Chaco. Everybody else is down to 1.2, 0.1, 0 0.3 millimetres per month. So really, really low rainfall. And then as the animals come up towards their peak temperatures, we start to get some more respectable rainfalls. But again, the data spread is massive with certain uh, regions hitting 100 mil. So Salta gets 98.9 mil per month. Whereas in the same month, Catamarca only gets 29 mil, uh, millimeters per month. So it's literally 60% less rain. And this animal is across the whole of that range. So making sweeping statements about ha ha the tropical nature of it or keeping them in a tropical enclosure, it's just not reflective of where the animal's from and the data simply doesn't support it. It's a fantastic snake. And even though it's rear fanged and you, know, it, you would associate them with being complex, they are absolutely wonderful. What a glorious looking snake. This one's got this wonderful dorsal line running down the back that seems to diffuse out and disappear but it's in real good contrast up, up by the head beautiful black lines you're just gorgeous you aren't you aren't you amazing i'm absolutely in love with this snake definitely a next step species definitely one that you'd want to research thoroughly prior to owning it's not something that you would take on lightly but very very interesting the origin of the species makes them an interesting challenge without being insurmountable. It just takes a bit of common sense. Do a bit of research. This is half an hour's work. Let's work out where we are, 
let's get some data from there let's have a look at how that how it all behaves we've got our rough average line so we know roughly how we're going to be plotting the year we know when their wet season is when their dry season is you know and uh it's ju it just you you take it a step at a time do it a, a bit by bit and you'll be just fine these are a hardy snake these will weather you making maybe er like slightly erroneous decisions and this is one of the more forgiving intermediate snakes so it would be a good choice as that first sort of next step if you wanted to challenge yourself with the colubrids and certainly will teach you about uh you know semi arboreal snakes from interesting areas of the world we'll be back with more videos soon we'll keep the videos coming as always your support means the world to me and paul we absolutely adore all of you thank you ever so much for following us and for subscribing to the youtube channel we're now at something like 2500 2600 subscriptions which is i just i can't fathom i never env envisaged that, that we'd get the channel to that sort of size so we're absolutely made up We'll be back again soon. All the best, guys.